The Battle of the Bulge was one of the bloodiest battles fought on the Western Front during the Second World War. A last ditch attempt by Germany to avert defeat, it saw hundreds of tanks and hundreds of thousands of men committed to a surprise attack through the Ardennes forest. The attack was the brainchild of Hitler, who against all advice from his generals, was determined to attempt an audacious knockout blow against the Allies. If the West could be forced to make peace, the German Führer reasoned, then the Soviets could also be pushed back and Germany saved from defeat. The operation, codenamed Autumn Mist, was to attack with the 5th and 6th Panzer Armies and the 7th Army, a stretch of the Allied front that was held by parts of Courtney Hodges' 1st Army. The Allies had focused divisions for their own attacks and had left the Ardennes lightly defended in order to do so. Spearheaded by elite SS Panzer divisions in 6th Panzer Army, the Germans aimed to smash through the American lines before crossing the River Meuse and sweeping north to capture the port of Antwerp. If successful, the Anglo-Canadian 21st Army Group would be cut off in a new Dunkirk. To Hitler's mind, it was a decisive, audacious attack that the Americans would be unable to react to in time. To the German generals tasked with carrying the offensive out, it was wildly overambitious. What Hitler perhaps failed to grasp was that there was a reason the Americans had so easily removed troops from the Ardennes sector, and that was its geography. Steep valleys, dense woods and numerous rivers had the potential to slow an advance to a crawl, particularly considering the appalling state of most roads in the region. This would be especially damaging to an army of which a startling rate of advance had been demanded, with German tanks ordered to be crossing the Meurs in just two days, even faster than had been achieved in perfect weather conditions during the invasion of France in 1940. Walter Modell, the man given operational control of the offensive, was not keen on the plan. Modell gave it only a 10% chance of success and tried to suggest alternative, more realistic plans, but was rejected. On at least six occasions, Hitler refused any changes to his master plan and insisted the offensive go ahead as he planned, setting December 16th as its start date. As the Germans prepared their attack, the Allies were focused on their own planned offensives, into the Saarland and towards the Ruhr dams. Through the autumn of 1944, the Allies took their eye off the ball, thinking too much only in terms of what they would do to the enemy next and not what the enemy could still do to them. It wasn't until December 7th that the Allies had any idea that an attack might be imminent, and it took another week for Omar Bradley at 12th Army Group, 1st Army's parent formation, to be fully briefed. Bradley was dismissive of the chances of any German attack succeeding, and is said to have declared, let them come. At dawn, on December 16th, Hitler's grand counter-offensive began. 18 divisions in the German front line began their attack, with their immediate objective to seize key road junctions and bridgeheads to allow the five panzer divisions to race towards the Meurs. Opposing the Germans were just six American divisions and Combat Command B of the 9th Armoured, holding a 60-mile front line. As grenadiers swarmed across the front line, American communications were hampered by heavy snowstorms, and it was difficult for the local corps commander, Troy Middleton, to build up a clear picture of what was going on. This had dire consequences for the 106th Division, which was holding the line near St. Vith. The 106th had only just arrived in Europe and its inexperience in the poor weather showed. Poor coordination between its regiments and its divisional HQ led to the 18th Volksgrenadier Division managing to encircle two regiments on the second day of the attack. With little in the way of reserves that could be used to rescue the units, both would go on to surrender two days later. However, the Germans did not have everything their own way, owing mainly to the bravery of small groups of stubborn GIs. At the village of Lanzarath, a single platoon of the US 99th Division held off repeated attacks from a battalion of German infantry, effectively holding up the spearhead of the 1st SS Panzer Division for an entire day. By the time this spearhead managed to reach Lanzarath, they were already badly behind schedule. The unit's 29-year-old commander, Joachim Piper, commanding Kampfgruppe Piper, demanded they continue to advance through the night to make up the lost time. His determination to allow nothing to delay his formation any further was to have horrific consequences the following day, when men under his command murdered 84 American prisoners of war near Malmedy. The massacre was symptomatic of the 
callous disregard for human life that the SS bred in its ranks, and word of it quickly spread throughout the Ardennes, stiffening the resolve of American divisions to stand and fight. As Piper and his merry band of war criminals hurried forwards, the Germans were just managing to bring the bulk of their tanks into action, following difficulties bridging the River Ruhr. Lacking behind schedule, it was now vitally important that they take control of the Ardennes' few decent roads, and so the town of Bastogne, at the centre of a number of important routes, became a key objective. Both of Fifth Army's closest panzer divisions, 2nd Panzer and the Panzerleer Division, pushed towards it, shattering the US 28th Division that stood in their way. With the 106th also crippled, and its remnants forced back to St Vith, the centre of the Allied line had now collapsed, threatening the entire Ardennes front. Understanding how severe the situation was becoming, General Eisenhower in Paris mobilised every division available to him. The 101st Airborne, which was refitting at Reims over 100 miles away from the Ardennes, was ordered to immediately deploy to Bastogne. To support them, Eisenhower ordered that 10th Armoured also move immediately for the Ardennes, with part of the division, Combat Command A, to be deployed in support of the 101st. Having been notified late on December 17th, by the morning of the 18th the first units of 10th Armoured began to arrive in Bastogne, and they were joined less than 24 hours later by 101st Airborne. Across the Ardennes, over 60,000 men were moved into the combat area in just one day, in a stunning logistical achievement. German intelligence had picked up the order to move the 101st on December 17th, but Fritz Beierlein, the commander of the Panzerleer Division, couldn't see how the Americans could possibly beat him to Bastogne. By the end of the 18th, he was only a handful of miles away. Underlining his confidence, in the early hours of the 19th, Beierlein opted to delay his assault on the town in order to clear out US troops on his flanks at Longville. The defenders of the village, a detachment of 10th Armoured, fought fiercely, and by the time Panzerleer and their supporting Volks Grenadiers had overcome them, it was too late. The 101st arrived in force and established a perimeter, and Panzerleer's attempts to push into Bastogne that day were a failure. Meanwhile, to the north, the Germans were also halted at Neuville, as two American battalions managed to hold off the entire 2nd Panzer Division for 48 hours. With thousands of battle-hardened American troops now occupying Bastogne, the prospects for taking the town quickly were remote. Furious with the lack of progress, Hitler now tore up his own plan. He ordered Fifth Army's panzers to abandon their attempts to take Bastogne and just dash to the Meuse as quickly as possible. Behind them, the 26th Volksgrenadier and 5th Parachute Divisions would encircle the town, under the command of Heinrich Lutwitz. Eager to do anything that might accelerate the advance, Lutwitz tried to bluff the Americans into surrendering the town, sending a letter that exaggerated the strength of German troops outside Bastogne and threatened destruction and annihilation if they did not comply, he demanded that the 101st's commander, Anthony McAuliffe, surrender the town. McAuliffe's response was to generate international headlines. Writing back to the German commander, he replied simply, nuts. It was a deeply embarrassing rejection for Lutwitz and yet another setback. Elsewhere in the Ardennes, things were no better for the Germans. As the Allies poured in reinforcements, progress slowed across the entire front. The town of St Vith was bolstered by 7th Armoured Division and held out until December 21st, denying the Germans another town crucial to control the road network for days on end. Even less progress was made in the north, where the terrain was dramatically worse and Hitler had foolishly ordered the main effort of the advance to take place. After several days of heavy fighting in the vicinity of the Elsenborn Ridge, 12th SS Panzer Division was forced to retreat and move further south. Kampfgruppe Piper, meanwhile, stalled west of Laglise, as the division was blocked by the 82nd Airborne Division arriving from the west. Within a few days, Piper's force would be forced into retreat from its overextended position in the first successful Allied counterattack of the Bulge. And so it was that 5th Army's central sector saw the greatest success. Joining 2nd Panzer and the Panzerleer Division was the 116th Panzer Division, which on December 21st had reached the River Earth at Hotton, where a small detachment of American troops was managing to hold off their initial attacks. The delay proved to be fateful, as it gave time for the US 3rd Armoured and 84th Divisions to arrive on the opposite bank and block the path west. The two Panzer Divisions emerging from Bastogne had better luck. By December 23rd, Panzerleer was preparing to assault Rochefort, and 2nd Panzer had its advanced units near Selle, 
just five miles from the Meuse crossing at Dinant. It looked likely now that the Meuse could be reached and crossed. Although both divisions were exposed without infantry support and were having to deploy much of their strength to protect their flanks, which blunted their spearhead. That day, as both divisions prepared to resume their advance, the weather turned. The low cloud and fog which had shrouded the German offensive lifted and gave way to a bright, clear day. Perfect flying weather. Hundreds of Allied bombers took to the sky and pummeled German logistics. Supplies to the tanks of desperately needed fuel collapsed. The 116th Division was rendered essentially paralysed around Hotten and was forced to go onto the defensive, while 2nd Panzer remained static at Sel. After a day of struggle, Panzer Lear did manage to secure Rochefort on the morning of Christmas Eve, but it was all too little too late. With each passing day, Allied strength grew and the German chances of success receded. By Christmas Day, it was clear. 5th Panzer Army's race to the Meurs had failed. Hasso von Manteuffel, the commander of 5th Panzer Army, was given the unfortunate task of relaying this information to Hitler's HQ. Confronted with defeat, Hitler ordered an assault on Bastogne, which had become a symbol of stubborn American resistance. Urged on by their Führer, small units tried valiantly to attack the town, but seriously damaged German logistics ended any hope of a full-scale assault occurring before the town could be relieved. The fiercest fighting at the siege came on Christmas Day, when tanks of the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division were able to penetrate the American lines near Champs before being repelled after reinforcements arrived from elsewhere inside the pocket. On December 24th, George Patton's US 3rd Army began a counter-attack from the south, aiming to relieve Bastogne. Pushing 7th Army's divisions out of the way, Patton's 4th Armoured Division arrived two days later, lifting the siege by breaking through German lines at Assenois and linking up with troops of the 101st Airborne. Though the Germans would continue to attack vainly around Bastogne for several days more, they would have no success doing so. Over the coming weeks, the Allies would launch a series of counter-attacks designed to flatten and push back the bulge and make steady progress doing so. Plunging winter temperatures and vicious German resistance made reclaiming the Ardennes an excruciating task, but it was a matter of time until even Hitler was forced to accept defeat. On January the 9th, he ordered the withdrawal of the 1st and 2nd SS Panzer Corps in an effective admission of defeat. Two weeks later, the last German units were withdrawn across the frontier they had crossed on December 16th, ending the bulge and the battle that took its name. The Battle of the Bulge was a brutal experience for both sides. The Allies suffered in the region of 96,000 casualties and the Germans between 67 and 84,000 troops. While the Allies could absorb and replace both manpower and equipment losses, the Wehrmacht had no such ability. Over 600 irreplaceable German tanks were lost on the offensive and its elite SS formations suffered grievous casualties. With Germany's panzer forces now crippled, there was little that could be done to stem the Soviet tide when it resumed its advance in January. When the Western Allies attacked in the spring, the Western Front also collapsed. Less than five months after the Bulge was defeated, the German Reich surrendered. <laughs> 